Hello, my name is Sam Felton, the Director of the Public Health Collaboration, and welcome to our 2021 virtual conference. It's been a difficult year to say the least, but I just wanted to start off by saying thank you to all of our ambassadors, members, patrons, and scientific advisory board members for all of your support through these difficult times. Without you, we would never be able to continue to better inform the public about the power of lifestyle to help create a better world. Now, before I let the next presenter speak, this conference is 100% free for all forever. However, if you find the content here today valuable, uh, then please consider a £2 donation or whatever you can afford via www.phcuk.org forward slash donate or if you're in the UK, you can simply text PHC to 70660 to donate £2 directly from your phone. And of course, texts are charged at your standard network rate. We hope you enjoy the conference from wherever you are in the world and be sure to get involved in the civil conversation here on YouTube or by using the hashtag PHC vcon 2021 on facebook instagram and twitter thanks for your support and be well hello everyone i'm lou walker uh, i'm a health coach and i'm a public health collaboration ambassador and i was able to combine both those roles last year in this project that uh, culminated in publication in the BMJ Nutrition, Prevention and Health. Um, I'm really excited, thrilled that Sam's asked me to talk to you about it because obviously it was wonderful to be involved. I'm proud to have been involved in the project that was successful and it was great to work with a fantastic team of people. But I'm also pleased to be able to shine a light on and give some recognition to the type of work that's been going on for years all over the country by PHC ambassadors, helping hundreds of people to lose weight, improve their metabolic health and reverse their type 2 diabetes, all through using low carb real food eating. And up until now, all of that would have been called, you know, anecdote, uh, case study, perhaps um, N equals one stories. But to have it in the peer reviewed evidence base is important because it gives other healthcare practitioners an opportunity to see that perhaps a low carb intervention, a health intervention in primary care really might be an option that um, is worth offering alongside what is already offered in terms of weight loss and diabetes prevention. So, you know, to, and if I could, if this video helps you know, just one more GP practice or primary care network consider offering a low carb program alongside their current offerings, my job will be well done. So I, I hope I hope that it's going to be useful to you. Um, I'm going to describe the program, uh, uh, its structure, the results and some implications for practice. Um, as you can see, we ran a health promotion program um, in primary care. We ran it on Zoom because of COVID. That wasn't our original, original plan, but actually it worked out pretty well. And in fact, um, we believe this is the first paper um, published to look at an intervention um, on, on Zoom. So I first met with Dr. Natalie Smith in March last year. She's the clinical director of a local primary care network in Hampshire. Um, and she was interested in some sort of low, she'd heard about the PHC um, and she was interested in one of our um, programs, group support, to support their patients with their weight loss and uh, diabetes management. And she'd heard about it from one of her GP colleagues elsewhere in Hampshire. He'd had great success with some programs run by my PHC colleague, Liz LeBlar, and good news travels fast. Um, we had planned to start a program, you know, a face to face program, perhaps with 12 people or so um, in May last year, but 
COVID put a spanner in the works there. Um, so I suggested that once Natalie and her colleagues could see the wood for the trees a little bit with, you know, what coronavirus and COVID was going to do, I had said that perhaps we could look at running a programme remotely online so that at least the, the patients still had had that available to them. Now I was crossing my fingers a little bit like this uh, at this time because I had never run anything on Zoom, let alone a health promotion programme. But I'm so glad we went ahead because, you know, I did have a sense that this was going to be important and an, an important way of doing things. And, 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 and so it turned out. Um, so fast forward three months and we were looking to promote our online program and this is the poster. Um, obviously the poster was completely useless because nobody was going to go into any healthcare, any GP surgeries to see it. So all the practices involved, we, you know, we adapted the, uh, the copy for emails and Facebook pages and websites and so on. And in fact, in the end, email was by far the most effective way of recruiting people, but had a huge amount of help, which was brilliant from some, some wonderful practice managers. Um, the program comprised an information session followed by six 90 minute sessions um, every two weeks. So it was a fortnightly program. Um, it was aimed at people wanting to uh, uh, improve glycemic control, lose weight, reverse pre-diabetes, and generally improve health and well-being. Uh, we also opened it to the carers and family of family members of people in those categories because they might have been doing the shopping or the cooking and they're definitely part of the support network. network so, so they're important too. Um, we ran the information session first because our approach is somewhat different uh, to standard advice. And we felt it was only fair that anyone interested um, understood what was involved. Um, so the information session introduced low carb real food, food eating, a little bit of the physiology and rationale behind it. We explained the types of foods they could look forward to enjoying and the sorts of foods that they would be uh, looking to avoid. Um, so just for clarity, this meant that they were going to be avoiding sugar, processed, refined and starchy carbohydrates, um, processed foods, um, and instead they could be looking to enjoy a whole cornucopia of real foods, fresh foods. So there was certainly going to be no deprivation, no hunger involved here. Um, we also made it clear that while all our material is evidence-based, um, it didn't constitute medical advice. So it was ex also explained that anyone on certain diabetes medications or um, medication for hypertension would need to check in for um, a re medication review with their um, healthcare practitioners before the start of the course um, and possibly even during because the positive effects of a low of low carb eating can improve uh, blood sugar and, and blood pressure really quite quick, quickly. Um, for extra guidance, we directed uh, Natalie's colleagues towards this paper um, in the BJ uh, GP, um, really useful, and I would um, sort of recommend that as essential reading for anybody who wants to support their patients um, with a low carb um, way of eating. Uh, something else we wanted to explain up front was that unlike other weight loss programs, we wouldn't be telling people what, how much or when to eat. There would be no prescriptive um, diet plans or diet sheets. Instead, we wanted to give participants enough information to understand the principles and, and, and the rationale for low carb eating so that they could feel confident in making food related decisions going forwards. We wanted them to understand how what we eat affects our health, not only our physical health, but also our mental health. And we wanted them to understand how other lifestyle factors like decent sleep and reducing stress manage, uh, reducing our stress and exercise and good gut health, etc., are also a huge part of the picture. Um, and we also wanted people to experience for themselves 
um, how the changes they could make um, really would improve their health and outlook, really give them back some va va um, Health isn't just about genetics and our environment. Um, and I'm a big, big fan of Wrong and Chatterjee, and I agree wholeheartedly with him when he says that health is something that you do. Um, so we encourage people to experiment and find out for themselves what worked for them, uh, what worked for their preferences um, and their family and their circumstances. Now, as it turned out, more people uh, signed up for the information session than we expected. Around 40 people signed up, which was brilliant. But in terms of me you know, running a program by myself, that wasn't going to work. So I put out an ABB to um, the PHC ambassador community and they were fantastic. So many of them came forward to help, to, 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 you know, to volunteer to run groups alongside me. Um, now it's a little bit of a long story, it's all in the paper, but we ended up with five groups, each with four or five participants and two facilitators per group. Now, I know that seems like overkill on the uh, participant to facilitator uh, ratio, and it probably was, but under the circumstances, the way things worked out, nobody had done this sort of thing on Zoom before. Um, it was pretty new to everybody, you know, participants and facilitators. So we thought, you know, safety in numbers, um, things have changed subsequently, but you know, that was that was what worked out and it, and it worked really well. Um, this is our fantastic group. This isn't, some of them were too shy, but this is our, some of our amazing group of uh, facilitators and help and helpers. They're all PHC ambassadors. They're doctors and nurses and, and nutrition therapists therapists and um, health coaches and they are all superstars they all gave up their time for free to, to work on this program and I'm forever in their debt they're marvelous um, we got some great you know uh, oh yes no and here are the participants we had 24 in the end that signed up after the information program um, Four of those, of the one didn't start, um, two dropped out, and one did finish the program, but she didn't collect or supply any data. Um, three were male, and we had a mix of ages. Um, uh, over half were over sixty years old. We had over, we had half of them um, were type two diabetic. One had a diagnosis of um, a current doses of pre, uh, a current diagnosis of pre diabetes. Um, all wanted to lose weight, um, although three of them had uh, an H, a, a BMI of twenty five or less. Um, what did the course look like? After the information session, this is how it went. Uh, the first couple of sessions was all about getting them started, giving them enough practical information just to get cracking with a low carb way of eating. Um, by session three, they've been doing it for four weeks and some of the initial, initial and motivation might have run out and they might have hit a few bumps in the road. So that was when we looked at behavior and habit change. Um, and uh, you know how to help them deal with some of the challenges they were going to hit. After session three, although all the groups did the set, covered the same topics, they might have done them in a different order because you know we had the flexibility to be able to give the give the participants what seemed appropriate um, at the time. So, for example, in my group. By session three, their hunger levels had decreased hugely and they were talking about starting to miss meals. So it made sense to talk about intermittent fasting in session four, but in it, it's different every time. Um, but anyway, every, everybody did cover the same topics, but perhaps in a different order. Um, all the facilitators had the same slide deck, but everybody was encouraged to adapt to that, put it into their own voice and style, introduce some of their own analogies and stories and, and so on. Um, we did make sure we maintained standards and fidelity uh, by meeting regularly on Zoom and, and on WhatsApp. So it, it all worked pretty well, really. Um, so, as I mentioned, we weren't prescriptive about what, how much and when participants ate and there was no calorie counting and no 
energy restriction. Instead, the suggestion was to experiment with recipes, focus on food quality and nutrient density, and to eat to appetite. We did signpost them to a huge amount of um, uh, resources. They were all pulled, the links to all these resources were all pulled together on a single web page. And we encouraged them to have a look and explore that to sort of further their knowledge and, and to uh, investigate. We had David Unwin's uh, diet guidelines. We had lists of foods, you know, red, amber and green, foods to avoid, foods to enjoy freely and foods to sort of treat with caution. We had podcasts and research and cookbooks and websites, you name it, we had it. Um, we really tried to support them. And of course, facilitators added lots of their own suggestions and ideas and resources along the way as well. Oh, something I should add um, is that between sessions, the facilitators all ran um, a private WhatsApp group or, or a Facebook group um, again, depending on the, on the participants to offer support between sessions. Um, now, it is possible that some participants found this uh, more unstructured approach uh, slightly disconcerting at first, because let's face it, it is different to all the normal ways of doing it where you're counting things um, and so on. But it was wonderful. They gained a fantastic understanding of the physiology. Um, they began to experience for themselves the beneficial effects of this way of eating. And they could see it in others as well. Um, and their confidence and knowledge grew. They became empowered. It was wonderful to see. You could see people, people changing as the weeks went on. So questions which might have started off as, oh, can I eat this and can I eat that? soon became, oh, I made shepherd's pie last night, but I used collie mash instead of potatoes, or there's a great recipe for a, a pizza base on Diet Doctor, or who knew you could make really decent chips out of celeriac. So all of that was, was really brilliant and, and uplifting. And the fact that that was shared and, uh, amongst the groups, they became quite close. The sharing was fantastic. And, and we, you know, they weren't accountable to us as facilitators, they were accountable to themselves. And we were hoping that in this way, they would build agency, um, self-efficacy, they would feel empowered. Um, so yeah, that, that's, I, I think that was uh, really important and, and perhaps contributed to the um, positive outcomes. Um, I mean, there's got a lot of data around that, around uh, group consultations, isn't there, in primary care for a lot of conditions. So this, this was no different, really. This was a, just a, a great big sort of series of group consultations. Um, here were our outcomes. Now, this is all the data we could collect. Um, we, did, we weren't able to collect nearly as much as we'd hoped. We were hoping to do blood tests before and after um, COVID stopped all of that, but, you know, it was what it was, um, but it turned out that all of these results, apart from HbA1c, were statistically significant. And that's what encouraged us to try and seek publication. Um, so body weight uh, improved by, they, you know, on average, uh, mean body weight loss was uh, 5.8 kilos, which was 6%, an average of 6%. Six and a half percent body weight loss. BMI reduced. We improved by two units. Waist circumference improved by uh, five point two centimeters. Um, systolic blood pressure improved by thirteen point one. Diastolic improved by five. Point zero and mental well-being also improved and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that in a minute. Um, HbA1c wasn't significant but it, it was clinically significant. We, we just didn't have enough people really in the sample that had a blood test at the right time. But as the, what was significant with HbA1c as this graph shows was that the higher somebody starting HbA1c A1c was um, the greater the improvement during the 10-week program. So this graph looks at HbA1c at start and end, and the blue dashed line going up through the middle shows the line where there was no change. And all the little circles show the values of HbA1c, um, and that's below the line, so that, that was all improvement. 
the black solid line is the line of best fit through the middle and as you can see it's, it's pretty good that was that was highly significant that regression at um, a p value of, of less than 0 0.001 and this is really encouraging isn't it you know the people who really need to reduce their hba1c by the greatest amount can do that within just 10 weeks and it has been shown quicker than that but these th this is completely in line with um, what other clinicians have found and other studies have found so so that's that's really encouraging uh, this is joe He's 73 um, and he he couldn't even remember how long he'd had diabetes. He said it was at least 25 years. Um, during the program, he uh, lost nearly eight kilos and at six months he'd lost nearly 14 kilos um, with a waist reduction of 12 centimetres. And he very kindly angled himself in his second photo so that we could see quite how much his middle had shrunk. Um, his HbA1c had improved and what really uh, thrilled Joe was that his insulin dosage reduced really quite early on in, in the program by 100 units a day which obviously would have helped his weight loss as well so that was a, that was a really happy story he was pleased about that and his wife was extremely pleased that he doesn't snore nearly as much anymore um, Jackie, uh, 67, uh, she lost nearly a stone, 7.2 kilos, and she kept losing weight after the program as well. She still is to this very day. Um, her dress size went down, which she was pleased about, and also her HbA1c improved. Um, and uh, I must just say that both Jackie and Joe have given their consent to their pictures and data being shared with you in this presentation today. So, as I mentioned, um, just looking briefly at uh, health, uh, mental well-being, uh, there is um, randomised control trial evidence. Um, you could look at the SMILES trial in 2017, for example. There's evidence that improving diet quality is an effective treatment for uh, major depression. And there's also evidence that diet and other lifestyle factors can affect immune activity and gut health to improve mood and mental well-being mediated through inflammation. Now, the, the evidence um, for uh, low-carb eating in this specifically isn't really there yet, but I'm interested in it. I'm always curious. So with my groups and my um, uh, my my clients, I always monitor their mental well-being um, over time. And that's what we did with this program as well. So we used a questionnaire called the, it's a validated questionnaire. It's called the Warwick Edinburgh Mental Wellbeing Scale. Um, and it's validated in particular to monitor change in groups over time. Uh, the total score you can get is 70 and um, a change of three points in either direction direction is likely to be important and noticed by in individuals. So we, as you can understand, were um, very pleased to see and encouraged to see that our mean change was an improvement of twice that, over twice that. So that bodes well as well. We also um, got some qualitative the qualitative data through um, a, a questionnaire at the end. And you can see there's all sorts of stuff on there, including less brain fog and better energy and vitality and, and so on. But what I'd really like to draw your attention to was two things. One is um, that people lost weight without hunger and their food cravings reduced. And this is really common with low food eating, sorry, low carb eating, and um, has been well reported in the literature. Um, so that's encouraging and that has to make a difference in how well people manage to sustain this way of eating. And secondly, um, have a look at the, the way people gained confidence in making good decisions about their health and gained confidence and hope that they could improve their health. And um, people were asked how confident they felt that they were going to be able to um, maintain the changes they would made on the programme. And... Um, over, oh gosh, I can't remember now, but something like 70 or 80% uh, said that they, they felt they scored themselves seven out of 10 for that. So, so, so that was um, really encouraging. And uh, 
you know, that hope thing, um, I've been really inspired by doctors, so David Unwin and Jen Unwin, who have done work around um, the importance of hope in behaviour change and health improvement. And I wonder if that isn't quite an important ingredient as well in um, lifestyle programmes of this nature um, in, and whether or not they can create sustainable change. Um, lastly, working on Zoom went better than any of us expected, really. Um, we all learned a lot, but 83% said Zoom worked really well for them. And the rest said it wasn't ideal, but it still was OK. And anecdotally, quite a few people told us that the fact that the programme was run on Zoom made it more attractive and more accessible. So, so that's also um, really helpful to know. Um, Strengths and limitations. Every peer-reviewed publication is going to have its strength. You know, it is, every study is going to have its strengths and limitations, and, and this one is no different. But I wanted to just talk about it a little bit because I wanted to highlight the pragmatic nature of this study and its findings. It wasn't perfect, um, but um, now I'm not a uh, I'm not a healthcare practitioner. But so, you know, who am I to say really, but at a time when primary care was really stretched, when obesity um, and mental health and everything that goes with that is, is going up. I, I just hope that, you know, the fact that this is a very straightforward, light touch program, it still had really significant results. And I was just hoping that that might offer some hope to um, to primary care practitioners. So, you know, apologies if that seems, you know, rather big headed, but you know, just trying to share the information, really. Um, so, you know, this was a like this is a service evaluation it wasn't just a trial it was a service evaluation to appraise the outcomes of a light touch health promotion program um, we couldn't as you know we couldn't collect the data we had hoped to collect we were very limited there um, the data we did collect was self-reported and that opens up the possibility of all sorts of biases you know and inaccuracies um, our sample was small and it was self-selected so that also you know provides its challenges but our small sample was an a, they were real people living real lives um you know in under very difficult circumstances so you know they're reflective if you like not if not representative um many of them were over 65 they had had diabetes uh, uh diagnoses for quite a long time and a couple were on insulin and any of those things would have excluded um, those any those people from some of the more um, major diabetes and weight loss trials, um, and yet our gang did really well, which is you know very exciting. Um, they all had great great outcomes, even though you know COVID made last year very very difficult and very very challenging. Some of them lost weight, even if they started off with a BMI of less than twenty five. And that bodes well, doesn't it, for weight gain prevention, which is also really important. Um, so we were, I don't know, we, we don't know, we can't tell which elements, which components of our programme uh, helped or you know, contributed to the, to, to the good effect, but we just know that something worked. Um, in fact, we had no way of knowing really what people ate um, and to the extent to which they complied with the low carb eating, if at all. But we did keep it pretty simple. Um, and maybe the suggestion to um, cut out sugar and starchy refined carbs and to avoid processed foods is enough to help an awful lot of people improve their health. Um, there wasn't any calorie counting. There was no energy restriction. Perhaps that was um, something that really helped as well. Maybe it was the, um, the fact that it was so flexible. Um, they could adapt it to suit their own circumstances. Maybe it was the peer group support and group, you know, which was, you know, along the lines of group consultations, as we've already said. Maybe it was the opportunities that they had to explore the effects of decent sleep and stress management and intermittent fasting. Um, we don't really know. Um, but the, the upshot 
of the whole program really was that we've got a light touch program with a low carb dietary component and it was effective. It could be run remote, you know, and that was even when it was run um, remotely. So perhaps it represents an option for weight management and diabetes prevention. Maybe it's something that can sit alongside as an option um, with, ev with everything else and it might save money. Um, there are GPs who have been doing this all over the country. Two of them, as you might know, are David Unwin and, um, in Merseyside and Kezar Sadru, Sadra in um, uh, uh, West London. And they have, you know, done the sums and they are saving for their individual surgeries around 40, 50,000 pounds a year. Um, and if you extrapolate that to the whole of the UK, you're looking at savings of uh, over 400 million pounds just on type 2 diabetes medication. So imagine if we could extend that to a medication and costs for all the conditions associated with type 2 diabetes and we can really start to see that the significant uh, savings there that could go towards all sorts of aspects of health help you know a, a, a prevention in primary care so you know it, it, it's really very exciting um, and I hope I hope you think so too so that's it um, this program ended in September uh, since then 60 other people have gone through in another couple of cohorts and they've all had similar results we're still in touch with them all and we're hoping to um, collect 12 month data over the coming months so it's very exciting and the work continues um, thank you so much for listening uh, I'm the corresponding author so my email address is on the paper and you can contact me through my website that's on these slides Seriously, if I can help anybody, if anybody's interested, I, I, I'm there. I, I'd really like to help. Um, I just, before I go, need to thank my co-authors, uh, Natalie Smith and Christine Delon. Christine is another PhD ambassador and, and she did the stats and was a, a complete rock. Fantastic. But do you know what? Probably the biggest thanks need to go to all the participants um, from the programme we've just discussed and the ones that have run since. And perhaps we ought to leave the last word to them.